Well, good evening to everyone. And uh, having announced this morning what I was going to be tackling this evening, I'm glad to see that there's anybody here at all tonight. So uh, well done uh, for um, bringing it out. We trust that God will uh, have a word to bless us and help us. Uh, one uh, thing, it's not on the bulletin, it'll be on next week's bulletin, um, but I'm just getting a little advance uh, notice for uh, Wednesday uh, week. Uh, we'll not have the evening uh, Bible study group here uh, on Wednesday week. Instead, uh, it's the annual uh, Headway Spring meeting. It'll be in Seymour Street Methodist Church in Lisburn and uh, at 7.45, and there may be a few others who might be going from here, and if you don't fancy traveling that far, you might be able to get a lift with someone. Uh, if you let me or someone else know, we can maybe uh, help to organize that. And then uh, the speaker at that is, uh, is, is David Turner, who's a, a senior barrister in London. And he's one of the, I don't know what the right word is, elders or leaders uh, in um, All Souls Church Langham Place, which was a church, of course, where John Stott was the rector for, for many years. And uh, his... He's originally from London Derry, and he's an old school friend of um, Ken Robinson's, who, who is our headway secretary. And uh, David's title will be um, Challenges to the Word of God in the Modern World or something like that. And uh, we're, we're sure that it'll be an, an interesting and challenging uh, meeting. It will be, I don't know whether it'll be streamed live or not, on, uh, but we will record it and there'll be a, a version of it available at some point um, afterwards. But if you'd like to come to that, um, the afternoon ladies' group will carry on as normal that afternoon, but not in the evening. So then let's worship God together as we sing a psalm. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. And let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we may come with joy into your courts to offer to you our praise and worship. For you are the great God who has made this vast universe. And all the life that is teeming within this little planet that you've made as a special part of your creation created so that human life might be able to exist here. We thank you, Father, that you have made us as the pinnacle of your creation, as creatures made in your image, capable of a meaningful, loving relationship with you. We thank you, Father, that we can know you because you are 
faithful and just, and you do not um, change. Your truth at all times firmly stood, the psalmist has written, and we have just sung. And so, we thank you, Lord, that though we are um, fickle and changeable and unreliable and sinful more so than perhaps we know, we come to a God who is perfect, a God uh, whose truth stands firmly, a God who has revealed himself through creation, through the Scriptures, and above all, through your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so, in his precious name, we come to offer our praise this evening. We thank you, Lord, for this day, a day of worship, a day of rest, a day of uh, time to spend with family and friends. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this day and this afternoon. We thank you for uh, the spring showers and for the sunshine and uh, though the wind has blown hard, we thank you, Lord, that not too much damage seems to have been done to most people. We, we ask, Lord, that you will help us to be truly grateful for all the blessings that we have. And when we um, see the, the difficulties that others face in other parts of uh, the world with regard to uh, the climate and the weather and, uh, and, and the struggles just to, to live life, uh, we are truly blessed. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for this church and for the warmth of the fellowship here. We thank you, Lord, that folks uh, in this church care for and support and pray for each other. Thank you, Lord, for the prayer meeting this morning before the service started as folks came in and, and prayed earnestly for the services today, uh, for people in our congregation who are going through difficult times, for those who are in particular need of prayer, and those prayers were offered up. And we thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of knowing that if some trial or tribulation or difficulty comes our way, that there will be those in the church family here who will, in various ways, and uh, in particular in prayer, will support us and help us and encourage us. So, Lord, we thank you for all these wonderful blessings. And so, Lord, we come this evening and we ask that your word will be, uh, as it's read to us and explained and opened up, that, uh, that we will understand it better and that in a world where these uh, issues are now um, turned upside down uh, in the eyes of so many, that you will help us, Lord, to be faithful to what you have revealed and to what uh, your word um, says. Uh, so that indeed we would recognize, even though those around us and many in the world will not, that your truth at all times, even to this 21st century, stands firmly. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins, cleanse our hearts and minds, and fill us now again with your Holy Spirit, that he may lead us and guide us into all truth and enable our worship and help us in our prayers. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, we are in uh, Leviticus chapter 18. And uh, I will um, be the reader this evening. And we will read, uh, be good to read the whole um, chapter, but I don't want to take just quite that much time uh, doing it. I'm hoping that this week coming, uh, if you haven't uh, been ahead of the game and already um, read uh, this far in Leviticus, uh, but if you're roughly on schedule with the rest of us as we uh, go through the beginnings, uh, you will be uh, reading this chapter uh, this week. And chapter 20, which kind of is a parallel of it, in chapter 18, uh, various rules and guidances are laid down, and then in chapter 20, uh, there are some further uh, details about the punishments and the consequences of breaking these laws. So we'll read uh, verses 1 to 10, first of all. I'll skip a bit, and then we'll read verses 20 to 30. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them 
will live by them. I am the Lord. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have sexual relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she is born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. And then the list goes on to describe various other permutations of incest that are all forbidden. And then uh, we come to uh, verse 20. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife, and do not defile yourself with her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the foreigners residing amongst you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things Such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements and do not follow any of the the detestable customs that were practiced before you came and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. And may God bless uh, his word uh, to us. In our prayers now for others, we'll take just a few moments and uh, I'll follow some of the prompts in the prayer focus today to to pray for uh, the uh, Kilkenny and Carlo circuit for the Ministry uh, of Healing Committee and the work uh, that they do for the MWI and for our world development uh, partners in Wenchi Hospital um, in, uh, in Ghana. And then uh, hospital, university, sorry, university um, and college uh, chaplains. And there's a a list uh, of them. I'll mention them. And then uh, we'll just have a little quiet time when we can think of people in our church family. Uh, There are some who are uh, going through treatment at the moment, some going for an operation tomorrow and someone else having some further chemo tomorrow. Uh, Some of these folks don't necessarily want their names mentioned publicly, but uh, some of you, many of you will will know who we are um, praying for, I'm sure. And then there'll be others, perhaps, that uh, uh, will come to your mind uh, that might not be known to us as a church, um, but we can pray uh, God's help and healing uh, for them. Lord, we come together this evening now to, to, to pray, to intercede, and we pray for our Methodist church throughout Ireland. We pray for our president and for the executive conference. We pray for the district superintendents. Uh, We pray for the various groups and committees in the church. And as some of them are doing work to prepare for conference, uh, finalizing uh, reports and other things that will um, be the business of our conference in June, we pray that you will guide them and help them and direct them in that. Uh, We pray for the Kilkenny and Carlo uh, circuit uh, we pray for Catherine um, Kyo, who is the minister uh, responsible for uh, this circuit, that you will encourage her and bless her and uh, the work in Kilkenny um, town and uh, in, in Carlow. We pray, Lord, that 
uh, in each place that there will be spiritual growth. Thank you for the outreach that there is in these places, particularly those who have come from other parts of the world, and particularly uh, the significant number of uh, Ukrainian families who have come last year uh, and maybe the year before um, because of the war there. Will you bless and encourage all the work that they do with such vulnerable people and bless their gospel witness and outreach? We pray, Lord, for the Ministry of Healing, their committee, as they organize various um, seminars and encourage a ministry of prayer for those who are sick. And we pray for Mark Durrell and Chris Matheson, who um, are the chair and the secretary of that committee, that you will bless them in the work that they do. We pray to you, Lord, for the Methodist women in Ireland. Thank you, Lord, for their strapline to know Christ and to make him known. And we thank you that there are nearly 2,000 uh, members of the MWI throughout the island. And we pray that you will bless all who are involved in their uh, central um, committee for the president, Olive Rowe, uh, for uh, Moira McMurray and Heidi Hogan and Elizabeth McWaters, uh, who make up the committee. Will you encourage them, Lord, as they uh, encourage women in their variety of ways that they, they meet? Um, some of the traditional MWI meetings have maybe declined in numbers as, as ladies have got older and, and younger ones have not joined them as the way they might have done in, in decades past. But we thank you, Lord, for those who faithfully continue this ministry, particularly for their interest in mission work and uh, in supporting uh, missionary projects. Lord, will you uh, bless them in this, in this work? And at a time when things might be um, changing in other ways too, we ask, Lord, that you will guide and direct um, the MWI. Thank you, Lord, for our MWI meeting here in Kalibaki and, and for the ladies who meet month by month and for their um, interest in uh, spiritual activities and missionary work and, and so on. We, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the program that's planned each year and for all who are uh, involved in it. We pray, Lord, for uh, Wenchi Hospital uh, in Ghana uh, that serves a wide um, um, area uh, with many people traveling many miles to be treated we thank you, Lord, for the um, input over the decades that uh, we've had from Ireland uh, with people who have gone to support uh, work there in various ways. And Lord, will you continue to bless both the medical work that's done as well as the Christian outreach in that place. And then, Lord, we pray for our university chaplains and uh, in the various um, places where they are, we pray for um, um, Brian Hickey in UCD and for Andrew Kingston in Trinity and Andrew Doherty also has a role there. Uh, we pray for Twanda uh, Sungai in Dublin City University, uh, Andrew Robinson in Cork, uh, Helen Freeburn in Galway, uh, for uh, Daniel McCulloch uh, who is the Joint Methodist and uh, um, Church of Ireland chaplain at Queen's. Uh, for Gail Mercer in uh, the Ulster University in Jordanstown, for Sam Livingstone in Coleraine, and Peter Morrison McGee in Londonderry. Lord, we pray that you will bless all the work that is done by our chaplains in our universities. We pray to you, Lord, for other Christian work in the universities. Perhaps the greater part of the Christian outreach is done by uh, Christian unions and Bible unions and so on, uh, run largely still uh, by uh, student leadership, and some of us, Lord, who've had the privilege of being students in the past have benefited um, greatly from our involvement in a Christian union and developed leadership skills and experience uh, through that. And so we pray that you will bless uh, all the Christian work that goes on in our universities and colleges. And then, Lord, just in a moment of quietness now, we bring to you particular individuals who are in need of our prayers, some who have had surgeries and operations and treatments, some who are waiting for further developments and for ongoing uh, treatment that will take perhaps several months. Um, for those, Lord, who are um, just waiting to um, find a diagnosis, more, more tests perhaps need to be done. And, uh, we just pray that you will guide and direct um, doctors and surgeons and others who are caring for such. And for uh, folks, Lord, who are supporting uh, such folks at home, 
uh, or some who've gone into or are going into nursing homes um, uh, for uh, further care and support. And just in a quiet moment, Lord, we bring those who come to heart and mind to you in prayer. And let's draw our prayers together as we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And I will bring our offering to God for his work. We'll sing together, take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord.
So Leviticus chapter 18 is a very interesting chapter. And I don't know uh, when, if ever, you last uh, heard a preacher from this pulpit or any other one um, attempt to preach from Leviticus chapter 18. It's a, it's a chapter that is very relevant to the world in which we live. It's always been relevant in one sense. Um, uh, but our Western culture in the West, in Britain and in Ireland, has become a sex-saturated society that largely uh, disregards the standards of past generations uh, and the things that we will find in the scriptures. Uh, I don't know when it began. Uh, some sociologists and others can perhaps trace this better than I can do. Uh, but certainly in the 60s, the, the swinging 60s as they call it, there was a sexual revolution which has gone through a variety of cycles uh, such that we now find ourselves uh, in 2024 in the situation uh, that, we are, uh, that we are in. I want to take uh, three headings that uh, Warren Wearsby has as little titles uh, for this under the overarching uh, heading for the chapter, uh, The Sanctity of Sex. Um, and uh, just unpack bits of this and then hopefully draw out some practical applications and conclusions for us. The first section deals with the authority for this teaching. The second section deals with some of the standards themselves, and we'll go through that fairly quickly. And then the final bit of the chapter deals with the consequences, the negative consequences of defying God and the patterns and principles that he has laid down uh, in his word. So, uh, first of all, verses 1, one to 5 in, in chapter 18, uh, there are uh, several reasons why the Lord gives these clear instructions concerning um, sexual morality and, uh, by implication, um, marriage. Um, for one thing, we are creatures made in the image of God. And so God is the architect. Uh, he is the designer. He knows how the thing works best. Uh, some of you are engineers and you know about mechanical things. And if something went wrong with some mechanical thing and you're able to get hold of the guy who designed it, the engineer who put together the drawings and then constructed the thing, um, he would be, uh, or maybe she these days, uh, would be the one who could explain to you uh, the principles behind it and how to get the best out of the machine. And it's always good to follow uh, the maker's instructions. It's a joke that I crack at quite often at most weddings that I, I conduct. Uh, one of the things I tell a couple uh, is follow God's instructions. God had chosen Israel, of course, to be a special people, to set a standard and to be an example to the nations around them. So that's another reason why these things are important for, for Israel. And the breakdown of marriage in the Jewish society and the adopting of pagan practices would threaten God's plan for bringing redemption to the whole world. Perhaps that's what Malachi uh, 2.15 means when he says, the Lord is seeking godly offspring. Uh, he wants Israel as a nation to uh, be faithful to the principles that he has laid, laid down. And of course, for us in our uh, Christian age, uh, our Christian marriages ought to be a witness to the world. And uh, Ephesians 5 uh, describes that, and the relationship of husbands and wives is talked about in the context of Christ loving the church and giving himself for her. And of course, if we treat marriage with contempt and the principles that lie behind it, then we undermine that witness. Three times in the short passage of just a few verses here, verses 1 to 5, we have the phrase, I am the Lord. 
Uh, and indeed, uh, this phrase, I am the Lord, appears 40 more or more times uh, in this section of Leviticus, Leviticus 18 to 26. And that's ultimately the authority that underlies this. I am the Lord. Now, sometimes when you're truly, uh, bringing up your, your children or maybe your grandchildren and your, your grandchildren say, well, why can't I do this? Or why can't I have sweeties before um, lunch? Or why can't I? Why, 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 why? And, uh, and, and sometimes as exasperated parents or grandparents, maybe you just sort of stamp your foot and say, because I say so. Uh, now, that's maybe not the best way to explain to a child. But ultimately, when God says, because I say so, because I am the Lord, that settles the argument. Because God does know best. Now, God is remarkably patient. And in chapters like this and elsewhere in the Scriptures, explains to us in the way that we should perhaps explain to a child why such and such a thing is not good for them and why they shouldn't be eating sweets half an hour before their dinner. There's a good reason for that. And if you want to go into all the biology of it and hormones going in and, and why you want, you, you can explain it. And, and maybe having understood it better, they'd be more inclined to say, oh, okay, well, I'll not, I'll, I'll wait till after my dinner. But at the end of the day, because mommy says so, is a jolly good reason for doing something or not doing something you shouldn't. I am the Lord. The Lord um, didn't want them to either look back to the people in Egypt and the practices that were common there, or to look forward to the land of Canaan uh, that God was leading them into, to imitate some of the practices uh, that were common there. And we'll conclude at the end with a, this graphic image of uh, the nation vomiting them out, uh, these pagan Canaanites with these various sexual uh, practices that were immoral uh, had um, resulted um, in this. We, of course, as, as Christians, have a whole raft of this um, teaching repeated for us in the New Testament, and I've got a, a, a clatter of Bible references, which I'm only going to use a few of them, uh, but I will read a few verses from Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, the guys don't have these, so um, don't worry about trying to find them up, but uh, you just listen and uh, you'll, you'll get the gist of it. Uh, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to, to, to God. But there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. God has set standards for us in all kinds of areas of life, but particularly here with regard to marriage and to sexual faithfulness and purity. Another fundamental principle that's outlined in the beginning, this little uh, opening section, is in verse 5, where um, obedience to God's command brings blessing. Uh, verse 5, you can throw that one on the screen, you've got it, guys. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. And there's that phrase again, I am the Lord. In other words, these things are positive things. Sometimes we Christians get criticized, oh, you're so negative, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Uh, well, if the thing that we're being told not to do is a dangerous thing, a dirty thing, an unclean thing, a thing that will cause harm to us or to others, well, it's a jolly good thing not to do it then. But ultimately, behind that lies a positive message that God wants to give us life. He's the one who's designed it. He knows how it will work best. He wants us to be fulfilled he wants us to enjoy all the good things that he has given. And as he created, uh, you know the little refrain that's uh, repeated uh, through the first uh, creation story, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. God has made good things. Sex is a good thing, used in the right way within the context of a marriage between one man and one woman. It's good. And these things are so that we might have life and enjoy life and live it uh, to the to the full. If people could perfectly obey God's law, of course, um, they would uh, not need um, salvation. But of course, we don't. 
Um, and uh, though this phrase is used a number of times in Romans and Galatians and so on, uh, those who do these things will live by them. Um, the New Testament makes clear that that's not how we will gain salvation. Uh, salvation is by grace. It's a gift of God. Uh, we are all sinners, Jew and Gentile alike, uh, but now righteousness from God has been revealed. Uh, that having been said, though, and it needs to be underlined, I suppose, as a basic principle for us as Christians, we ought to be living in obedience to God's Word. Yes, we're saved by grace. That's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. But we're saved to do good works, to live the kinds of lives that God has designed for us to live. <clears throat> uh, another commentator sums up these introductions uh, in this simple way in verses 2 and 4. He says, it's a call to be loyal. Uh, verse 3, he says, is a call to be different. And then finally, verse 5, a call to life. So that's, that's the authority. That, that what, that's what underlies the rules and regulations uh, that follow now with regards to the standards of uh, sexual practice. Since God invented sex and ordained marriage, he has every right to establish the regulations that control them. And our obedience will help to protect these wonderful blessings that are gifts from God. If we have uh, the modern laissez-faire attitude of, well, anything goes, and if it feels good, do it, and all the rest of it, uh, are only going to be uh, to people's detriment. And for us as Christians, if we uh, maintain God's standards, we may be mocked and ridiculed and thought very old-fashioned, um, Victorian and such like things uh, we might be um, called. Um, but that only underlines the dangers of these things uh, that will distort what God has designed and cause a great deal of harm in all kinds of, of ways. Uh, depending on which translation you read, if you're reading the King James, uh, the version here in the beginnings is um, slightly different again from the NIV, which I have uh, read from. Um, the, the, the phrase... Um, in the King James, it's repeated, uh, uncover the nakedness of, um, simply means to have uh, a sexual relationship with. Um, and uh, the phrase uh, to, to, to cause um, uh, um, uh, shame or, 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 or defilement um, is, uh, is that uh, phrase as well, because you, you uncover the nakedness. So there, there's something that is quite... Um, uh, I suppose, explicit, uh, that's um, clear about these intimate relationships. And um, the prohibitions that uh, follow here are then followed up again in chapter 20, I think I mentioned that earlier, uh, that deal with some of the, 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 the judgments and the punishments. Um, the first set of them, quite a long set, all deal with various kinds of, of incense. A person who has a relationship with his stepmother, for example, would be uncovering the nakedness of his father. And most modern societies, of course, um, prohibit um, consanguineous marriages. There's a big word. Um, it, uh, it means a blood relation. And in fact, it used to be the case I, in America. I don't know if it was ever the case here. That you, uh, certainly in America, you had, to, um, you, you had to have a blood test before you get, get married, just in case, because I suppose in America, people moved around so often, and you, and you wouldn't know that maybe you were marrying your cousin. And so they did blood tests to make sure that this wouldn't happen. Um, and quite apart from any uh, moral dimension to it, which is at the heart of what's here, of course, there is the added um, danger that uh, if you had a uh, sexual relationship with a close uh, relative, that uh, it might um, bring out the recessive genes and, and cause various kinds of um, um, genetic diseases that, uh, of course, would damage the family. Um, one, so the, the, the list goes through a whole platter of different types of incest. Um, uh, the one exception uh, in Leviticus 18:16 um, that talks about um, your um, sister-in-law, um, there is one exception to that because later on in Deuteronomy 25, you have what's called the law of leveret marriage. Of course, it's referenced in the New Testament when some wisecracking 
Pharisees asked Jesus a trick question about the resurrection. Uh, they say there was this bloke, one of our um, folks who uh, had a, um, a wife, and then he died. And then the brother had to take over the responsibilities of fathering a child for the, um, and, and uh, then they all died. And, and then the question, the trick question is, when, when they get to heaven, um, whose wife will she be? And of course, Jesus answers, um, you are um, missing the point because you don't understand the scriptures. Um, so that, that, that's, that's the, the one um, uh, exception, just to make that comment in, in, in passing. There is, of course, uh, an example in the New Testament in the church in Corinth. Uh, We read about 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and Paul uh, writes, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you of a kind that does not occur even among the pagans. A man has his father's wife. Um, I don't know that this is a particularly uh, relevant and hot topic uh, for the village of Kalibaki. Um, It's unlikely that um, there are many incestuous relationships going on in the village. But it just underlines for us that marriage is a protected thing that God has designed. And there are rules about it. And this long list of rules about um, incense are spelt out I think in some detail, lest there be any confusion amongst the Israelites so that they would know that these things were forbidden by God. Then we have uh, in um, in verse um, 18 a very explicit, sorry, verse 20, uh, a very explicit uh, repetition of the commandment in the Uh, in the Ten Commandments in in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, you shall not commit adultery. Okay, so it's not just um, incestual relationships that are forbidden. Um, Adultery is forbidden. Um, A man might um, argue perhaps, well, I can join my my neighbor's wife because she isn't a relative, so, uh, so that's legal according to these rules. But of course, God said it wasn't. And the Bible um, repeats those commandments in all kinds of ways. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Proverbs 2, for example, says uh, it will also, this is wisdom, will save you from the adulteress, from the wayward wife and her seductive words, who has left the partner of your youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the spirits of the dead. (coughs) Uh, So adultery uh, was clearly uh, forbidden and condemned, and its consequences uh, were serious. Um, Jesus expands it in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We looked at this uh, a year or so ago. Um, he says, Matthew five twenty eight, I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the act clearly is forbidden, but dwelling upon it, imagining it, uh, lustfully, uh, lustfully, um, um, Dwelling on the thought, uh, Jesus says, uh, is a sin as well. Um, Galatians 5, 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and uh, debauchery. James 2, 11, uh, do not commit adultery. Uh, He who said do not commit adultery said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do commit murder, you become a lawbreaker. God's law is laid out for us. And the uh, consequences are serious and significant. So we have, first of all, this long section about incest. Then we have the restatement of the commandments about adultery. Then in the next verse, verse 21, we have warning about Molech and offering our children to Molech. Uh, It's it's stated very simply. In chapter 20, it goes into a bit more um, detail about it. I want chapter 18, uh, verse uh, 21. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech. You must not profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. That phrase again. Some people have wondered what's that stuck in there in this section about various sexual relations that are forbidden? What's that doing? 
Um, uh, Molech was a god of the Ammonites, and uh, the, uh, the practice that uh, pagan, wicked pagan practice that God forbade uh, was uh, offering a child as a living child sacrifice um, to Molech, um, sometimes done throwing the child into a fire, dreadful, hard to even imagine to think about it. Um, now, it may be just that uh, this was a, a pagan practice that here God wanted to condemn, but I think perhaps there's something a bit more to it, because the whole purpose of marriage uh, is for the establishment of stable family life. Father and mother, husband and wife, and not every marriage, of course, is blessed with children, but that's the normal way, and the, the phrase we have in the, in the, in the uh, uh, in the order of service that I use for weddings, um, says, and when blessed with the gift of children is God's chosen way for the continuance of humankind. So that's, you know, we've ha had our mom, mom and dad and they brought us up and sometimes the granny and grand in the background as well have supported them. Uh, so the protection of children is a very important part of God's overall design and plan for sexual relations within marriage. And this offering of children to Molech is perhaps a very extreme example of the harm that is done when we depart from the pattern that God has designed. I guess we could possibly apply this to the practice of widespread abortion, healthy children sacrificed as kind of means of contraception. We might also apply it uh, to uh, the sexual abuse of children uh, which isn't specifically mentioned anywhere in the Bible, though it is the one thing perhaps that our culture will almost unanimously condemn, and the sexual abuse of minors, of children, of course, is, uh, is clearly uh, a wicked thing, and perhaps this verse uh, refers to that also. Then there are two more things that are mentioned. So adultery, Sacrificing of children to Molech. And then uh, in uh, verse uh, 22, we have uh, the reference to homosexuality. Uh, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Uh, the King James says that's an abomination, and you've probably heard the phrase, you'll have had various people who reject this teaching, of course, and they will uh, pick up that phrase that the King James is an abomination. Some people use it to condemn people who have uh, a homosexual orientation or inclination, as well as those who are practicing homosexuals. It's an interesting word, and uh, in uh, the, the, the Hebrew word is translated, of course, into the Greek translation, the old Greek translation, which is then the same word that in Greek is used in Revelation 21 and verse 27 which says uh, which says this, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, what is shameful is the same word that is here translated uh, detestable or an abomination. I think that's a striking thing, isn't it? That in describing the things that God will not allow into heaven, things that are deceitful or shameful, the same root is at the, uh, at the bottom of, of this homosexuality. Uh, we can pick up the theme in Romans, I'll not do it now, but uh, the commentary, the New Testament commentary on this, of course, is uh, Romans chapter 1, uh, which not only condemns homosexuality between uh, two men, an abomination when a man lies with a man as with a woman, uh, but Romans 1 also deals with homosexuality amongst women with lesbianism and condemns that as well. And then um, the final little thing on the list of um, things that are forbidden uh, is bestiality, uh, both for men and women referenced uh, here in Leviticus 18. Now, these things have not changed, and it's really only in the last few decades 
that anybody within a broad Christian world has tried to um, justify homosexuality as something that's okay. And that God, if it was a faithful relationship between two men or between two women, that God would be content uh, with that. Um, there is nowhere in the New Testament that provides a grounds for saying anything like that. Um, in fact, quite uh, the reverse. It's not mentioned all that often. Uh, if any of you want to have a little kind of explanation of all of the teaching in the Bible, or a good deal of the teaching in the Bible, um, I did a podcast with uh, Heather Morris some months back, just been released recently. Um, this is an issue that the Faith and Order Committee are working on, and uh, the podcasts, there were, there were five of them that were done. I think Heather had intended to do six, but couldn't find one to balance. But uh, there's, there are two theological ones. Um, I have done one. Uh, from the point of view, of course, which you would expect from me, and then another from a more liberal revisionist uh, point of view. And you'll find them on YouTube. Go to the Methodist uh, website. You'll find links there, or just go onto YouTube and search Irish Methodist Church. And uh, it takes about, I think I lasts about 35, 40 minutes, and I go through the various scriptures. And, and if you want uh, to follow that up, you're, you're welcome to, to, to do that. But I just want to say uh, this, first of all, um, that people who have committed these sins, whatever the sin is, and some of these things might be fairly dreadful sounding things, don't they? Uh, difficult enough even to preach about on a Sunday evening. Uh, those who have committed these sins can be forgiven and become children of God. Uh, Jesus says, Matthew 12, 31, I tell you, every sin... And blasphemy will be forgiven, people. Though blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven, we'll deal with what that means some other time, perhaps. Every sin can be forgiven. And uh, Paul, when he writes uh, to the Corinthians, we could have picked up a number of themes in Corinthians, but I'm just going to pick up this one. Uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians and, uh, and chapter 6. And uh, I'll read a few verses, verses 9 to um, 11. And uh, Paul uh, says, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so all of these lists of sins, sometimes called a, a vice list, these lists of, of, of uh, vices, uh, will keep you out of the kingdom of God. Underlines why these things are so serious. But then he goes on to say this, and that is what some of you were, that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So all of these sins can be forgiven. Whether they are more serious, I guess perhaps you could argue, there is a case to argue that some sins are more serious than others for a variety of reasons. But every sin, apart from rejecting the gospel, which I think is what blaspheming the Holy Spirit means, uh, can be forgiven. And we ought to preach that gospel of grace while maintaining biblical standards on sexual morality for the sake of ourselves, our families, our children, our grandchildren, and our nation for those who fall, for those who are tempted in this or in the other area, they can be forgiven through faith in Christ. And then one final little section to conclude with just for a couple of minutes. The consequences of this. The picture here isn't a pretty one, of course. And sexual perversions, like many other diseases and germs and so on, spread and make a society and a nation sick. Then the land itself becomes sick and vomits out the filthy people uh, the way that the human body will vomit out something that is causing it to be ill. Tragic, of course, for those people made in God's image that should end up as vomit. And note that these were Gentile nations that were, were judged, uh, people uh, whom God had not made a, a covenant with, uh, but he still held them accountable. Uh, again, you can go to Romans 1 and see the consequences of that. 
And if God so dealt with Gentile nations whom he'd never given his law, how much more does he hold to account those who do possess his word? And that, of course, includes us. There are dire consequences to sexual sins, and the judgment is greatest where the light has been the brightest. Alas, of course, in its history, Israel, time and again, disobeyed God and defiled the land, and in a sense, they were vomited out and sent off into exile. Today, we live in a world where these things have become normal, become broadly acceptable, and the notion that you can do whatever you like as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else has become the basic moral principle by which most people in the world set their standards. Of course, we can debate whether living like that doesn't actually do harm to others. If it harms our society, if it harms our children, if it sets them bad examples, uh, if it causes families to break up, and for children to be brought up without their biological father and mother to nurture them and love them and guide them and direct them, then of course for society and for those individuals within it, it does have negative consequences. And as Paul tells the Galatians, God will not be mocked. God sets out for us certain patterns for behavior, certain rules and regulations, guidance for how we should live our lives as people, but as Christians in particular. And if we will flaunt those, if we will say, oh, well, that doesn't matter, and uh, I can do what I like, and, uh, you know, um, I suppose God will forgive me. Well, yes, um, God will forgive the repentant sinner. But there are still consequences to our sins. And perhaps in the realm of sexual sin, maybe more than other things, those consequences can be lifelong, and they can be damaging, and they can um, spoil our witness and our testimony, as well as hurting those who are around us. So, not the easiest thing to digest for half an hour of a Sunday evening, but I trust that you will, as you come through this week, uh, to read not just Leviticus um, 18, but chapter 20 and the other bits that will follow as well afterwards, um, that you won't be overly daunted uh, but you will hear God's word and see in the book of Leviticus some practical guidance that is still relevant to us today. Now, you will have some people who will throw up things like uh, planting two types of different uh, grain in your, in your field or wearing, uh, wearing a, 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 a piece of clothing that's got mixed fibers in it. I'm just checking what my, I, th I think this is wool. Um, uh, but, uh, and they, they, they sometimes throw that out as a red herring. Well, well I mean, if, if God had certain rules about wearing, uh, wearing uh, polycotton mixtures, uh, not that they had polyester back in those days, but they, then, you know, we can just ignore the whole lot. Oh, no, you can't. And there is a distinction between some of the rules and regulations that were given for uh, kind of cultic or for um, 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 uh, ritualistic um, reasons that did have a purpose at the time because it marked God's people out as different. And those things may have passed and may no longer be relevant for us. But those things that, he, and this chapter 18 clearly is one of those, that, uh, that, that, that talk about moral principles, which are repeated, emphasized, and indeed made even more demanding in the New Testament are most certainly still relevant for us as Christians and for our world today. And so we are challenged uh, by these things. And I'll conclude with uh, those three little pointers at the beginning, that these chapters, these verses in Leviticus, call us to be loyal because he is the Lord. They call us to be different, not like the Egyptians or the Canaanites or the Ammonites, or, but to be like God's people and call to live life to the full. For as we follow God's guidance and obey his, seek to obey his laws, repent when we fall, but trust that God will lift us up and give us his Holy Spirit to live lives that are holy, that will be the life that will bring the most blessing to us and to the world around us and bring glory to God. Amen. And we're going to conclude, uh, it's an old-fashioned hymn, but it sums up this, this principle that God's word is God's word. 
and God's word has not changed. And so, Lord, thy word abideth. Let's share the grace together and bless one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.